Welcome to another conversation on CFO Chat. ABSA has released their full year numbers for F22, sterling numbers, I should say. We're delighted to have Moses Mudu as always. Karibu sana. Thank you, Julian. It's good to talk to you this morning. Moses, let's pick up from where we left last time. Yes. I was asking you about the issue of your liquidity ratio. I was Correct. asking whether you are too thin, close to the ground. When I look at the numbers this morning, yeah. looking quite bumped up, right. it looks like you plowed in some capital in Q4. Yeah, so obviously I think the history around this is uh, as we came into the end of Q3, uh, with global commodity prices and the opportunity for oil importers uh, uh, to participate uh, in that market and therefore us extending trade loans. Uh, we really grew our corporate investment banking balance sheet in one month by 40 billion. You know, that, that, that's almost like 40% of that book, right? Because the opportunity was there. But these were short-term loans. So that put pressure a lot on our liquidity ratio, but also our capital ratio. Uh, and then the conversations were... How do we deploy capital? Where do we source capital? And where is it efficient to do that? And then, lucky within APSA Group, we always have capital at the shelf. Uh, so it's a very quick operation uh, to get into discussions uh, around capital injection, this supplementary debt, tier two capital. Uh, we got $50 million towards the end of last, uh, last year. Um, within the macro context where capital is scarce and applying capital across the sovereigns of the continent is a challenge. Yes. So it, it also has to be because of the return and the potential the group saw in our business. So we got $50 million. Uh, that's why our total capital ratio is, is actually 18.5. Uh, after paying dividend and increasing dividend by 23%, uh, we are sitting at 18.5. Uh, reg minimum is 14 and a half. So very good, very good buffer there. Uh, obviously, capital and liquidity have a symbiotic relationship. You know, capital helps you write your risk-weighted assets. Risk-weighted assets consume your liquidity. Your liquidity ratio is challenged. Uh, so part of that capital injection helps us or helped us with that rotation between capital to liquidity and back again uh, through returns. Uh, and so, so we are seeing, we're seeing a good position now in terms of our liquidity ratio at uh, circa 34%. Um, but also deposits. Our deposits are up 13%. The market is only up 4%. So uh, we wrote uh, faster deposits that are qualifying for liquidity in November, December. Uh, and I think all this is preparing ourselves um, for momentum in 2023, uh, but unusually uncertain times uh, as well. There are headwinds. Speaking about uh, momentum in 2023, let's look at the external environment now coming in. Right. Last year was a very unique, unique year in the sense that we saw a lot of uh, hiking of the, C, the benchmark rate right. by about 175 bips. Right. So my question to you is, to what extent are the numbers this morning reflecting loan repricing by ABSA? So we are in uh, about uh, 100 basis points. Uh, uh, and by the way, part of that came to the tail end of last year. So really, we are only in probably 50 basis points or, or half a percentage point repricing uh, on the book that we came out quarter three with, yes. uh, which means then the extra... Uh, 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 75 and another 50 came in later in December and lastly towards uh, the end of January. So a big part of that 175 uh, uh, is going to be at this year's uh, upside. So momentum is looking good. Um, obviously the weighted average lending rates are not like for like. If the central bank rate goes up, it, it doesn't go up like by like. We have a base rate which is weighted T-bills and uh, the reference rate. Um, the central bank uh, rate. Uh, and so it's not like for like mathematics, but the upside, you're only seeing a small part, only in Q4. Most of that upside actually is into this year. When you look at our growth last year, 9 billion revenue growth, 25% from 47 to about, uh, to about 46 billion. Um, 3 billion of that is rate increases. Yes. Half, four and a half billion of that is volume, productivity in the balance sheet. Uh, so that productivity in the balance sheet, if it continues and rate upsides are there, um, we're seeing good momentum on revenue this quarter and the coming quarter as well. So the upside is uh, expected to build into 2023. Sorry, this sorry. ideally would be the first full year under the um, risk-based lending, I could say. How are you positioning yourself for the runway ahead? And I'm asking that because for the other banks I've spoken to in light of their F22 numbers, right. you've seen a bit of caution. Uh, one of them has gone fast on the digital channels on risk-based right. as opposed to the um, typical lending going on risk-based. So, you know, I always say the core banking is risk management. You know, the, the way doctors study medicine to save lives and lawyers study the code of law to help people get justice. Bankers and banks... Uh, study risk management to really manage and help capital move around. You can't do that without pricing for the risk. 
So risk-based pricing is the core of our profession and our DNA. Um, and so when you think about it that, that way, um, and you get the tools to price for risk, uh, you're actually doing your core profession or your core duty because you're transforming deposits to loans, you're pricing for that and paying, uh, uh, you're writing loans that come with credit risk, market risk, uh, liquidity risk, and you're pricing for that, and you're helping the underlying economy grow. Uh, so I think that's the thesis. Uh, Risk-based pricing sounds like it's a foreign concept just because just because of rate caps in 2017. Yeah. It's always the core of banking ever and ever. So I think for us, we are being uh, targeted on where it makes value for both our customers and the shareholders. Yeah. Um, uh, because to, to be told, um, there's softness in the economy. So while the entire system is safe, uh, there are some pockets where there are challenges. Uh, so you have to balance between do I actually price up uh, and get people into debt distress, yeah. right? Then you are writing back uh, all the profits through impairment two years down the road, three years down the road. Or do I cautiously find my way to balance between not getting people into excessive credit yeah. and higher rates that will mean distress, but also making sure we're not carrying capital that we're not earning a return. So pricing for some, that, some of that risk by increasing the price is also important. So this, this is the balance we have to take because uh, we have to be responsible uh, corporate citizens as well. We don't want to get people into distress because every time you reprice loans, uh, customers fall out of uh, parameters. You know, uh, seven-year loans become 10-year loans. If you don't extend their maturities, you increase their rates, they start to default, yeah. they get into distress. So there's no benefit of doing that just because it helps your P&L today and putting the economy into distress. So we have to balance it, this one, and how we execute it. Okay. Moses, your portfolio quality looks pretty good, uh, but on the other hand, here you are ramping up provisions. Right. And the question is, when you look at the horizon ahead, yeah. you are skewed towards abundance of caution. Right. Why is that? At usual and certain times. Uh, you know, we came off COVID. We thought COVID had receded. No one, could, no one could predict the impact of Russia, Ukraine, yes. what it does to inflation, Therefore, interest rates as a toolkit to manage that inflation. What does that does to distress, uh, sovereign distress as well as credit distress? Um, make no mistake, there are silver linings in our economy and our outlook. But the real challenge is that we didn't know they were going to be there. Yeah. Uh, and we have to just uh, uh, be cautious. Now, provisions are management judgment. And, and I always keep saying, uh, at the end of the day, there's a point where accounting standards reach and the management has to apply is judgment. Do I think things are getting better or worse? We hope we are wrong. We hope actually things get better, <laughs> right? We, are, we actually hope we are wrong that things get better, not worse. So we release that upside. Uh, but we've, we, have, we have add in the side of caution. So uh, forward-looking provisions are up. We kept the COVID provisions. We've added onto those. Uh, we haven't written back anything since this situation of geopolitics started to affect uh, our side of the region. Uh, so forward provisions are up, uh, which are management overlays. Um, uh, coverage is up to 81% uh, because we're saying, what if we're not able to realize securities faster? Because, for instance, uh, in the unfortunate event, we have to liquidate assets. Where is the market to liquidate those assets? So you have to say, what if these things don't happen as fast as they used to? increase your coverage. It's conflicting uh, that you're providing more, coverage is going up, and NPO ratio is coming down. But we, we hope we are wrong, because if we are, it's only an upside to our financials. If we are right, though, we're prepared and covered for it. Okay. And um, when you look, spoke very bullishly about the state of the business, firing on both barrels, non-funded income very strong, funded income very strong. But when I go to your non-funded income, right. in, in F21, yeah. Foreign exchange trading income was 35% of, right. of that revenue line. Right. Currently, it's almost half at about 49%. Right. Don't you think you're getting ex exposed, especially if you look at the developments around trying to stabilize the interbank market? Yeah. So I think it's transitory opportunities. It's actually what made sense to participate in uh, through the last few months and the last year, and even up until now. Um, so we saw opportunity in the FX market. Uh, and, and I think our ratio is perhaps lowest, and our growth rate in terms of effects income is actually on the lower end. Um, uh, and that is for many reasons. 
Um, but I do think rotation of opportunities. I actually think uh, uh, clients now worried about uh, future outlook of their cash flows or forwards, futures, and swaps, so derivative opportunities of their risk management products, given interest rates and where they're going. Uh, we see that real opportunity than buying and selling of FX, even, even though we do that to support active client activity. But from a revenue point of view, there's only one way margins are going, and the margins are coming down. So we have to think about structuring around our financial markets products uh, to ensure that we are helping our clients, but then we are covering any risk that uh, gross FX income that comes from client activity comes down. Uh, obviously, we hope the economy activity rebounds, continues to rebound. Uh, uh, that in itself, we increase the volumes, uh, despite margins coming down. But we are very aware of that risk. I think the good thing is, um, when I look at the growth rate, you know, a non-funded income is 17%, net interest income 28. Yes. So we are, we are really pumping where we are. We think we are we have a sustainable accrual business. And where it's fee-based business is a function of the market, the activity, the interest rate environment, the FX environment. Uh, that will react to opportunities in a transitory manner. As they come, we go in. As they go, we move out. All right. And still on the non-funded side, um, yes. your income line in terms of uh, fees and commissions from loans and advances right. down yes. uh, by double digits. Right. Don't you think, again, you're exposed? Look, I think it's the absolute number there. So it's, it's down 20%, but the number is 300 million. It's 380 million. Now out of an income base of 46 billion. Not to ignore it, but to say the exposure is not that significant. Yeah. When, I took a look, when I look at that 380 million, 300 million is accounting treatment. So we used to book Timiza revenue as non-funded. Yeah. Uh, we re-looked seriously at uh, accounting rules and actually said, no, we earn this revenue because someone is getting money from us. So we moved that to interest income. Uh, the good thing is to be comparable now because we've now watched that reclassification last year. So that 300 of 380 will be comparable going forward. So we're talking about 80 million reduction and it's lending activity. Uh, um, you, you, when you think about corporate lending, it doesn't have attached immediate fees like short-term trade loans and whatnot. Um, uh, and so unsecured lending, uh, if that comes back and lending activity goes up. However, risk-based pricing has a blended price. So it's, it's the time we begin to think about our income line in, in, in aggregate. Because now risk base says you have one price. Yeah. There's no fee at the time you lend. It's, so we have to think about our revenue line in aggregate. What is, what is our total income line? And what's our total NFI? Okay. Yeah. $50 million worth of an injection um, in light of the prevailing environment. Are we seeing you posturing for more appetite for dollar-denominated facilities? Uh, look, so I think, um, first of all, we are, we are hedged from where we sit. Look at our foreign currency lending book, uh, increased from 31% of overall lending to 34%. Not a big change. But we are net positive because we brought in $50 million in, yeah. Yeah, despite that small increase. So we haven't seen any uh, impact on our earnings from a currency exposure point of view in terms of the balance sheet we carry and the capital and funding we carry to do it. So we are, we're, fairly, we're fairly OK. Um, we think with a $50 million uh, uh, funding line or capital line, the opportunity in foreign currency asset, when it comes our way, we'll take it. Uh, and I think we are prepared for that. Uh, so it was firstly, get your capital ratios right. So you need capital. Yeah. Secondly, do you need local currency or foreign currency? Surely in this market environment, let's get, the local, let's get foreign currency. Know, then now your foreign currency, you're like, OK, now I have it. I need to use it somewhere for a return. You can use it for local currency lending. So we are well positioned for foreign currency lending. OK. Yeah. Speaking about the impact of uh, foreign currency and the FX consideration yeah. on your income lines, but now let's talk about the impact on the portfolio quality. Are you seeing the challenges, not really challenges, the movement you have seen on your NPL ratio? Yeah. To what extent would you say this chunk is attributable simply to FX? Uh, minimal, right? It's minimal because, because when it's very really minimal. Because when you look at the industries, right? So when you look at NPLs, 22 billion. 2 billion is accounting because it's based on the interest that we hope we, we, we do not think we'll be able to recover. So it stayed 20 billion. When you look at 20 billion, NPL absolute, 16 billion is personal households uh, and manufacturing, right? All our personal households loans, 99.9% .9 are local currency, right? Uh, all our manufacturing loans largely are single names, local currency. 
And so 60% of my NPL is actually entirely, and, and of course the 40% also most of it is. So in terms of the NPL uh, base being affected by translation losses uh, because of currency, any currency depreciation, that is, that is a bit limited. When I look at the currency uh, depreciation and our earnings overall, last year depreciated 7%. The impact on our earnings was about 100 million on cost, 108 on impairment, 480 million, right? But we were hedged on the balance sheet, so the revenue also came through. So net, net we stayed positive. So even with a 7% depreciate, depreciating currency, my PL is uh, profit and loss account is net neutral, right? It's, it's net neutral. The challenge is market risk. The challenge is market risk. Uh, and the challenge is what you do with your FCY liquidity. I think now, now we are sorted on that. Uh, and any exposures when you lend from an FCY point of view. And the challenge is the financial assets we have around FX assets, derivative assets tied to the FX. Uh, this is where the challenge is. And then finally, is what the FX uh, um, movement does to assessment on sovereign distress or not, and credit distress or not. So there'll be more distributional challenges to the business as opposed to we have a challenge one-to-one -one in the PNL. Because if, if there's any challenge and distress of the sovereign because of macro factors, yeah. uh, your credit appetite will go low. Our exposures will have to be cut. So this is what I see as distributional challenges as opposed to a one-to-one -one direct impact in our PNL today. In case you lost, FCY is foreign currency lending, so, so yeah. back to that. Yeah. So Moses, let's, uh, I can see Charles is standing here. Let's uh, get to the tail end of this. Um, you spoke about a hat trick. Your EPS is up, your DPS is up, but your dividend payout ratio is down. Great. Why? Function of earnings, right? So, when our, so here's the thing. So profit after tax up 34%. Um, we've increased dividend 23% to 7 billion. Uh, so even with that increase, our DPS is slightly down, dividend per share of our earnings per share. Uh, but it's a function of the earnings per share really surprised us uh, to go at 34%. It equally surprised me. I think, I'm happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the way we look at dividend changed if anyone took lessons from COVID. There's no way of saying we would pay dividend on a progressive payout. What if you can't afford because there's COVID and capital theme? You can't pay 50% or 55%. So we have to always think about it going forward around to the extent capital can afford it, will then increase the payout ratio. Uh, this year we applied a third test. What is the absolute increase on the dividend itself? We had an option to pay up to 60, 65, but I've just talked about the road ahead. Uh, but progressive payout, in other words, the payout ratio will progress to the extent capital can afford it. Of course, cap capital afforded last year, but there's demand on that capital in terms of we have to grow, lend to the economy, lend to businesses. So there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a share of that capital that is going to other, to other uses. Uh, so I'd, I'd say, as a management proud, dividend is up 23%, 7 billion of our earnings being paid to shareholders. Um, um, there's a question about is this sustainable? To the extent capital can afford, I think we can sustain it. We wait to see how the share price behaves in, in light of that. Now, yeah. we're, the, we're at the end of a strategic horizon Sorry. and uh, transitioning into a new one. When you look at the rear view, are you happy with what you're seeing? Forward looking, what can we expect? I think we've laid a solid foundation for the business. The last five years, our revenue has grown 16 billion. The five years before, 2013 to 2017, it only grew by 2 billion. Yeah. That's eight times. Efficiency ratio, we used to run with a cost to income ratio of 55, 60%. We are now at 41. We are holding it, it, it will go to 30s. Um, it just tells you we are well positioned. Where is the flow on this uh, CTI? Um, I think the flow is uh, how fast we invest back. So we need to invest back to 45%. We need to really, really invest back in our people, in our system, in our businesses. We have a custom business we are launching, taking investments. Origination of loans is going to be fully automated. Origination of accounts fully automated. We are taking our data centers to the cloud, cloud computing, automating back office, paying our people well. Staff costs are up 11. Uh, building our brand. Uh, we have close to 900 million shillings to spend in our brand and role in society and sustainability this year. So these are good things and good costs to support future growth. Uh, so we, we are in a good position now. We can say the challenge is how do we invest for a 10x return, 10 times return for what we invest in. This is a good place to be. 
uh, returns 23%. So we've laid the foundation for the next phase of transformation. And this is going to be about scale. We fundamentally believe exclusive businesses are not sustainable. The fewer people you serve and the fewer sectors you serve and the fewer corners of the economy and the country and the market you serve, the less sustainable you are. Inclusive businesses will stand the test of time as the most sustainable businesses. We have to look at our retail business and serve 10 times more people than today in the coming strategic horizon. Make sure our corporate business is connecting ecosystems. Uh, invest in brand technology and people. But this horizon of our strategy with the foundation we've laid is about scale. Scale is not what we are looking like now. We, we like the growth and the momentum, but scale is a different thing and we are going for the scale. And in terms of uh, market share, where do you desire to be in the next horizon of strategy? So today, revenue market share is about 7.98%. Uh, we need to go to double digits. Uh, we have to take market share from somewhere because the pie is the same. Uh, and that means we have to be very smart and very deliberate in the products we create, how we engage our customers, how relevant we are, why should people move from one bank to the other or one financial services sector to say a, a player to another. So there's an art and a science. I think the art is the more complex part. But we think the science is 8% to probably 12% uh, in the medium term without damaging profitability. So it's gaining market share without excessive risk in the company. So it's not about lending. Let's lend. It's about payments. It's about collections. It's about transactions. It's about digital channels and as well lending. Uh, because obviously as a bank, you have the, the fiduciary responsibility to take care of the economy and its people by lending for prosperity and for the economy to, to advance. Uh, and it ties back to, to who we want to be, make sure that we are empowering economic growth in this country. Final question, Moses. Something that jumped out at me when I looked at the ABSA asset management, uh, advisory income is up almost fourfold. Right. And um, in an environment where pipelines are drying up, yeah. people are struggling to keep advisory business afloat. Yeah. How are you posturing in this market? I think it's bonds. Uh, remember, we never used to have an investment business. Uh, so therefore, uh, it's as simple as you keep deposits with us. How about we show you how to invest these deposits in uh, bonds where you can earn an annuity or an income out of it. Um, and so there's almost cannibalization. But we'd rather cannibalize ourselves than be cannibalized by others offering these solutions we didn't have. So we're seeing that rapid immediate growth. Uh, that business has doubled in revenue. Uh, it's a small business. We only started it uh, about two and a half years ago. At the target, it becomes a mature business. Uh, so it's really just that activity on board, bond investments uh, and helping our clients invest in bonds and earn more as opposed to earning less by money sitting in our deposits, uh, deposit accounts. Okay. Now let me close with this. Right. We've seen a bit of shakeout in the banking industry outside the globe following right. SVB. Yes, yes. Are you seeing any spillovers here? How do yes. you assess the response yeah. from those markets? Look, I think the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, SVB in West Coast US, uh, is a unique situation. This is a bank that stood behind venture capitalists and startups and assumed that the gift will continue to give. Startups will mature, make money, pay their loans, and the cycle will continue. Uh, owners of capital, venture capitalists, will continue to provide capital to startups to continue that cycle. Um, that didn't work because it was a monoline business. And when it doesn't work and there's trust and confidence issues that you actually are not able to return people's money, then you get into a run. Uh, the entire system in the U.S. is solid, in my view, but it doesn't mean everyone, every player is solid. The good thing is that bank is now being uh, uh, resolved uh, slowly but surely by the regulator. So I don't see spillovers for that. But market don't like uh, volatility. So there's been extreme volatility because of that action in the U.S. markets. To the extent that rates are going up, which means we'll see more money leaving sub-Saharan Africa into the U.S., and that's how we'll get to begin to fill it. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lesson on business model. Uh, and fundamentally, when a business model doesn't work, how do you sustain trust and confidence in the system? Uh, 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 and this is the bedrock of finance. And regulators every day, every day, have to worry about trust and confidence in that part of the world as it is in sub-Saharan Africa. Moses Mudumi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Julian, for having me. Thank you.